as a general rule, the best way to do it whenever you're teaching it to the whole group is just reading that. And whenever someone raises their hands, you just tell them, get out. And then you keep on reading. <laughs> you don't tell them to get out. You say, I might explain, like, I teach, so I pull the same move in class all the time. Mm -hmm. Let me finish what I'm saying, because I might answer your question <laughs> as we go along. And if you still have a question afterwards, you can talk with me privately. That's right. We like to teach our Blood on the Clock Tower players like little kids, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Hey, I'm Devin. And I'm Mary Kate. And we're picking up pieces. A channel all about board game pieces. And how to pick them up. And in today's video, we're going to give you 10 tips on how to story tell in Blood and the Clock Tower for the first time. So recently we've gotten together a group to play Blood on the Clock Tower once a month. And as of last week, we have both been the storyteller for multiple games. Two for me. So multiple meaning two. Mary Kate has done it like four or five times. Mary Kate yeah. enjoys it a ton. Yeah, it's really fun. So these are 10 things that either we learned as we went through that we wish we had thought about beforehand or things that we did prior to storytelling that we thought were really helpful and important. And so how the list is going to be organized, pretty much it's not based off of importance. Rather, I try to organize it on chronologically. Like these are things you want to do farther out you are as you get closer and also inside the game some tips as well so let's actually start it off with number one know the flow of the game this is a very broad numbered topic one so what do we mean by uh, know the flow of the game Mary Kate? so when we're talking about know the flow of the game we're not just saying no day phase night phase nominations voting also you need to know how much time are you, tr as a storyteller, trying to allocate for each thing? Knowing how to tell when you need to go around and tell people to wrap up their conversations mm -hmm. and come back um, to the group. We reached out to our friend Jared, who has story told a lot more than us when we were mm -hmm. starting to story tell and got kind of some time frames of like three or four minutes for different day phases. Um, from him which was honestly a big help because everyone will talk forever if you let them yeah so for the first day we uh he suggested doing five minutes and then every day after that doing three to four minutes and then adjusting to the flow of the game like how conversations are going yeah. thinking on the fly so but that general outline is super helpful and again also by knowing the flow of the game if you're completely just doing your first bit of research no, there's a day phase, there's a night phase, there's a voting phase, and that knowing that the first day and first night is going to take a little bit longer. Oh, yeah. Um, so watch videos and other stuff like that to know that. So point number two is be familiar with the script you're running. So in Blood on the Clock Tower, there's three different types of scripts. There is Trouble Brewing, Bad Moon Rising, and Sex and Violence. And... Your first time you do this, you will be doing trouble brewing. And For you're sure. going to do trouble brewing a lot before you move on to anything else. We ourselves haven't even moved off to trouble brewing. We're getting close. We're going to do it one more time, one, yeah. uh, gameplay. And then we're going to go on to do probably Batman Rising, maybe. Yeah. But, I mean, we've played games. Of, well, I've played games other than trouble brewing. But it's important, especially if you're pulling mm -hmm. together a new group that they get used to how it works, where information is still somewhat reliable. Yeah, because the other scripts can get crazy. And so whenever you get to know the script, you got to know the, the details of the characters. We know all the characters and how far it can go. Like, for example, we had a person playing who ended up messing up one of the details of the characters, saying they had some information. And... In the script, that character got more information than that person thought they got. And so they kind of got caught. They got caught. They got found out. That, that they, they were, were lying <laughs> because they didn't know it. And that's okay for the person playing. But for you as a storyteller, you need to know when to tell somebody if they had that question. Like me as another player, I'm going to ask the question like, oh, should the person know more than this? And as me as a storyteller, I need to know off the top of my head, head yes, this person should know more than this. Yeah. So... No, try to know the script based down to the details of the characters. I should have worded that better. Number three, be familiar with the grimoire. 
So the grimoire is your giant book that you have all your information in. And so when we're talking about being familiar with it, what was really helpful for me before I started storytelling was when I arranged what characters I would use, I practiced setting it all up in the book, how it mm -hmm. would look like as we started and then went along. So what would it look like when people died? What are reminder tokens that I need to mm -hmm. use for different characters? If like, for example, if you're playing with the character, the Virgin, who when someone nominates them, if they're a townsfolk, they die. Their ability only works once. Mm -hmm. So when they haven't used it yet, you need to have a reminder token that says their ability is still active. And then when it's not, you swap it out to show that if someone nominates them, they won't die. Stuff like that. So that in case you don't remember everything that's going on in your game, you can look and see mm -hmm. exactly what's supposed to be happening. Especially with the um, first night <laughs> reminder sheet and like every other night reminder sheet. Mm -hmm. How to use the little reminder pips to stick in there just to remind yourself who all do I need to wake up in what order. Because it matters that you wake up the poisoner before you wake up the empath. Yeah. And it, the rule book, they actually have already like a little demonstration of like how it should look. Yeah. So they have a diagram for you in the rule book on how you should lay it out. And so make sure you get familiar with that. Because me, I definitely messed up whenever I didn't know how to use the drunks, of, um, how to set that up in the grimoire. And so I ended up telling somebody that this person was the drunk uh or no you put the token for the drunk in the bag for people to pull out <laughs> so yeah knowing those type of things are useful and so definitely get familiar with the grimoire the giant book because the book is the case for the game the box is actually a player piece which is really cool but so that's number three number four prepare a couple of games beforehand yes because on the fly, you're not going to be able to come up with something very fast. It's going to take a hot minute in order to come up with a couple of scripts or games to, for people to play. Yeah. After you've done it a while, you probably don't need to prepare them in, in advance. But especially for your first couple goes. Also, tip. Don't just prepare the number of games that you think you're going to play. Because then if you have, like, someone accidentally pull two tokens out of the that bag. That will happen. At the very end, and everyone's seen their character, um, and you have to restart. You don't want to restart with the exact same characters, because then everyone knows who's in the game. Mm -hmm. But then you're having to remake everything right there on the fly, and everyone's just kind of sitting there waiting on you. Yeah. So having a couple ready just in case is and, helpful and probably make a couple of different games on different play accounts so if you know mm -hmm. you're going to have 10 players come into play maybe make some with like nine or eight or maybe 11 just because more some people probably aren't going to show up yeah. to the game and so be able to prepare a few games whenever you guys get together because you want to probably play a couple in a row since you got everyone there with you all right number five include a lot of information gathering roles slash powerful abilities yeah don't be afraid to make them too powerful i did that i was afraid of making them too powerful and didn't provide an, i only had provided one information gatherer and they happened to die the very first day we were so confused and so no one had information <laughs> and was able to get information besides all the first night information outside of that they were flying and blind so i was doing some major help to the good team <laughs> because I messed up. So don't be afraid. And people, whenever they're playing for the first time, they want to feel powerful. Mm -hmm. And so you want to put a good taste in their mouth so they want to come back and play again. Yeah. So definitely don't be afraid of that. Give as many information gatherers as you want because they're rookies, they're not gonna know what they're doing. And also really strong yeah. roles if they're not information gatherers. Yeah, because you want everyone to feel like their role is important. And so they feel like they're active actually an active part of the game and they're not just sitting waiting for things to happen yep so that's number five number six go ahead and make sure you pump up the people you're playing with yep. prepare them before in advance don't just like oh hey come over here and you invite a lot of people and play the game with them like 
tell them like a month or weeks in advance or however much time you have to kind of like mentally prepare them and get them excited. Yeah, so you want to make sure that you tell people like, oh, it's like this and you want to explain it kind of like in an excited way because mm -hmm. then they're a lot more willing to participate in all the kind of silliness that happens when playing a game of blood on the clock tower. Yeah, which number six naturally flows into number seven get some people and let them watch some videos beforehand. So you have some people who know how the game's supposed to flow outside of just you. Uh, make the game go way smoother. So after you get them excited, pick out a couple people that you know are really bought in and get them to watch it so they can help you kind of guide the game and know yeah. how to do it. So they have some strategies kind of of what questions to ask and how to interact with each other. Yeah. And so you can share them some videos with the official Blood on the Clock Tower YouTube channel or even No Rules Barred. They're kind of known for the Blood on the Clock Tower gameplays. And those will just get them a feel for it. Again, it doesn't teach them the game, but as they're watching it, they'll know how it's supposed to go. And it helps yeah. out so much. It might even be better than you actually getting experienced players to mix in with a group of new players. Because the experienced players might take advantage of the newbies. Wait, it's still newbie versus newbie. And... Uh, with doing it like this. Yeah. So that's number seven. Number eight, teach the game how it's written. So Blood on the Clock Tower, um, the people at the Pandemonian Institute did a great job mm -hmm. at providing basically the sheet that you read word for word verbatim mm -hmm. as you're explaining the game. Read it. Don't take a lot of questions, okay? Teach the game how it's written. You'll mm -hmm. end up with some people who will get something in their head of where they, they're not quite understanding one thing and they'll get really hung up on it and they might ask you a whole bunch of questions about the one detail. Forget them. Now, <laughs> they're really going to want to know the answer. But mm -hmm. in them asking when they've not played yet, it's going to confuse all the people who had not even thought about that yet. Yep. So start the game and make yourself available for people to ask you questions about their role during the game. Because mm -hmm. they might be hung up on one role, but then that role's not even in your, like, it's not even a role you chose to yeah. play in the game. And so it's not something everyone needs to be stressed about moving forward. So don't be afraid to say, um, I'm not taking any questions right now. After we start, you can come talk to me privately. Yeah. Just reading that sheet is really useful. Like obviously different people learn in different ways, mm -hmm. but as a general rule, the best way to do it whenever you're teaching it to the whole group is just reading that. And when if someone raises their hands, you just tell them get out and then you keep on reading. <laughs> you don't tell them to get out. <laughs> you say, I might explain, like I teach, so I pull the same move in class all the time. Mm -hmm. Let me finish what I'm saying because I might answer your question <laughs> as we go along. <laughs> and if you still have a question afterwards, you can talk with me privately. That's right. We like to teach our Blood on the Clock Tower players like little kids, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> 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 all right. Uh, Number nine balance talking and getting on track so talking about treating them like little kids um don't treat your players like little kids listen to me people are going to act like little kids while they're playing in this game they're going to get really into it and they're going to just straight up like not stop listening to you like yeah. you become like a teacher in this game where you having to constantly gather cats and get them back into the seats because they're going to want to keep on talking in the different rooms that they go split off in and it's going to take time. But in saying that, you have to balance it and not be too strict. It's still a game. Like you're trying to have fun. So yeah. make hey, I think went on one end of where you allowed a lot of freedom and letting people almost a little bit, not like walk over you. That's too strong of a word. But you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I will, especially like my first night of yeah. doing it, I did not want to, I didn't need teacher Mary Kate to be the one doing it with our friends. Like I, yeah. didn't, want, I didn't want my like middle school teacher voice to come out. Mm -hmm. um, so I was a lot more lenient on, I gave them like a, I'm going to need you back in like one minute. And then I went around and I was like, come on back. And then mm -hmm. half the people come back and then I'd be like, shoo. Go back to the center. We all got to vote. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. And me, I saw that they just straight up were not listening. 
um, it took him a long time to follow directions. And so for me, I overcorrected and I was like, nope, whatever I say goes and this is how it's gonna go. Do like whenever I said, <laughs> told people, oh, come back, I did give him a few seconds, but I should have been more lenient than what I was doing. So you have to learn how to balance that and it's gonna be okay. Because the final tip is you're gonna mess up and be kind to yourself. Yes. You will mess up in this game. You're gonna mess up several times. Um, and that's okay. People are going to be very lenient on you. You have the biggest responsibility out of everyone playing the game. And people are still going to have a blast regardless of you messing up. Yeah. There were a few times I forgot to wake people in the night. And everyone went. And I was like, never mind, everybody. We had to go back to sleep for a minute. Yeah. like And, like, it was fine. Like, everyone came back. I gave the person their info. I waited a second. And then everyone and I, it, everyone still had fun. Mm -hmm. I overthought it a little bit because I was like, oh, no, I'm ruining everything. Like, yeah. It's, it's not that big a deal. Yeah. Like, uh, and a common mess up is that you're going to – somebody's going to point to someone, and you're going to point to the person they're thinking about and ask them if this is who they're pointing at. Or, and they're going to be like, yes. And that's not who they were pointing at. And so that's going to be a constant miscommunication. Again, tip about that. Point down at them, not across at them. The depth, it's hard to tell. Tip this number person, 11. be this person. Yeah. Be like, him? Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's easier for the silent communication. So definitely, I think those are our 10 tips on how to storytell for Blood on the Clock Tower for your first time. And yes. so we're really excited about it. We want to spread Blood on Clock Tower love as much as possible. Let us know in the comments below if you guys have run any games of Blood on the Clock Tower. Have you played any of those games? Um, let us know your experience with it. Do you like it? Do you hate it? Why? And, Why? and then we're going to interact with you and tell you you're wrong if you hate it. So <laughs> that, that's, that's and, our video. <laughs> <laughs> what, you got something to say? No, I was just going to say, if anyone's giving you a hard time, it's that one. Make it, you know, I'll, it's never me, all right? So, <laughs> but more importantly, we value all of you guys. And if we had the chance, we would play, love to play board games with every single one of you. So until next time, bye. Bye.